I don't know. It's just fun. <laughs> oh, that's all I got. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 304. It's the second week of June of 2022. I'm Ethan. I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and the only wrestling podcast. We have one of the most memorable matches of the modern WWE era to talk about coming off of Hell in a Cell. There is a new championship in AEW, and their booking has gone even more off the rails than it ever has. A lot of things that I'm very excited about. New Japan Dominion coming up this weekend is not one of them. It's one of the more predictable <laughs> shows I've ever seen. But uh, let's start with uh, talking about Hell in a Cell. It was a two-match show going into it, and uh, those two matches were the opener and the main event. The, women, the three-way for the Raw Women's title opened the show. And then Cody, with a torn peck, main evented that show, Hell in a Cell against Seth Rollins, in what was not probably a five-star in-the-ring match, but turned into one of the more compelling performances ever because he completely tore his peck off, off, his, off the bone. And and worked a match with it anyway. It was something else. What did you think of Hell in a Cell? Yeah, I think that uh, what you said about it being a two match show is is pretty accurate. Nothing. I didn't think anything else on the show was bad by any means. Um, the six man was all right. We'll we'll get to Edge in a little bit. Um, but as far as the actual, uh, you know, the wrestling up and down on the show was fine, except for the almost match. But you know, <laughs> can't win them all. Um, and yeah, the opener was really great and I thought had a, a, a pretty clever uh, wrinkle to the, the classic house show three-way finish of, uh, of, you know, somebody hits a move and then the other person races in and throws them out of the ring and steals the pin. Uh, they actually kind of made that the whole story of the match. So I thought that was a neat little touch on that very modern and very uh, overused finish for a triple threat match. And then, yeah, you had a... Uh, the main event, which, you know, it's it's really way up there. And I was thinking about this going in. It's like Hell in a Cell is not very interesting anymore as a concept. And part of that is because instead of doing a Hell in a Cell match, when it's time to do a Hell in a Cell match, you just do a Hell in a Cell match because there's a show called Hell in a Cell now. Yes. And part of it is because, in my opinion... You can't bleed. <laughs> and I don't know that a Hell in a Cell match feels particularly unique or different in, a, in, a, in an environment where you can't do any like wrestling violence. Um, so I did not have, I, I thought it would be a good match because Cody and Seth have worked really well together on the last two shows, but I wasn't expecting a lot. And then, yeah. The, the news broke, I guess, over the weekend that Cody was was hurt and that it was feared that it was a torn pectoral muscle. Um, WWE was very quick to point out that he did not tear it during the brawl with Seth Rollins, but during his weight training later in the week, which I thought was just fascinating that they kept pointing that out. Um, it was but, bizarre that they kept pointing it out as well, was it not? Like what? I thought so. Like I thought, I thought, oh, they're mad at him. <laughs> like they're they're upset that he hurt himself and maybe and i thought maybe he was gonna lose because right. of it um right but they they stayed the course um and as you said cody's performance uh you know both both his selling and i'm sure his real life pain that he was in he had this giant horrible bruising all up and down his chest and up and down his arm which only got worse the next couple of days he put a put a few more pictures up i think on his instagram and it's the the bruising is going all the way down to like his wrist now and i mean he did finally get the surgery this week so but it was it was known that he was going to need surgery and that he had torn it as as was the quote completely off the bone yeah. um and he still went in there and he couldn't 
do a lot with that side of his body because of that. So he just did what he could to work a kind of a one-armed match. And, and two, I will get, I, I think uh, Seth Rollins deserves a lot of credit too, obviously, because he had to be the motion of this match for the most part and really had to keep everything moving and, and move from you know, kind of your big stunt piece. And like, I don't know if Cody could have physically opened the legs of a table, for instance, in the state that he was in. So just like the logistics of the different spots and stuff they did, we were all pretty much set up by Seth. So really good job by him. And, and then, yeah, Cody gave an incredible performance. Um, I understand there's a, a certain th- train of thought of you shouldn't let a guy that that's this injured into the ring because it sets a bad precedent. And now if somebody else it has a similar injury and says they don't want to work or they're too hurt to work, well, will they be looked down upon by management? But I mean, to that, I would say, you're already looked down upon and thought of as replaceable by management, unless you are Roman Reigns or Brock Lesnar. So like, I don't know that I don't really feel like this was like a, Oh, this is a bad precedent. Cause you're, you're reinforcing that old wrestling stereotype of you got to work hurt and you got to make your towns and all that stuff. It didn't feel like that to me. It felt like the damage was for, for the most part done. I'm not saying that he couldn't have hurt himself worse. Cause I'm sure he could have, but I assume he felt and their doctors felt that if he worked the match a certain way, he would not do any more damage. And with that in mind, they went out there and and had an all time classic. And as people have pointed out, you know, real, real life athletes work with, uh, with torn pecs and biceps and things like that. It's not, it's not maybe advised by, (laughs) by, by medical professionals, but it's, but it is a, uh, you know, it is a thing that happens in real sports as well. So I didn't, I I didn't see a ton of that, but I, I understand the concern over, was it a good thing that he did this match at all? But, you know, as it stands in a bubble, incredible job by both of those guys. And it's, it's maybe the most memorable WWE match in the last, in the last decade. So they then uh, shot an angle on Monday Night Raw where they teased that Cody was just not going to take any time off whatsoever and was going to go after Money in the Bank at the intimate confines of the MGM Grand Garden Arena. (laughs) And then we did an injury angle where Seth uh, beat him up with a sledgehammer. So very, very gently beat him up with a sledgehammer. So that uh, apparently has written him off for a while. And we have Money in the Bank coming up next. No Roman Reigns on Money in the Bank. Although apparently he's going to uh, defend the title on television against Matt Riddle before he uh, defends it against Randy Orton at SummerSlam. But he's going to defend it on television rather than at Money in the Bank. Is something weird going on with Roman Reigns that we don't know about? Feels that way, right? Like... And again, I don't, like, we don't have all the information. Yeah, because it, I mean, I know there's the word, the word of, well, he's got a new contract and he's restructured and he's working fewer dates. But if he was already scheduled to be in uh, Las Vegas on that day, if it was in a stadium, the idea that they would like just be like, well, it's not a stadium anymore, so we don't need you or or we're just going to do this match on TV instead. Like I, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me but maybe fox wanted a roman reigns to wrestle on their show this calendar year and and this was the solution to that you know you got maybe i feel like there's especially with the uh the brand split sort of once again slipping away seemingly a little bit more and more maybe there's a feeling of like oh well universal nbc universal gets gets all the raw stuff and then they get the pay-per-views because they own peacock so we want a we want a world title match on 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 our on our Fox show since we pay you all this money. Maybe there's maybe there's some some TV business involved in this, but yeah, just the the whole handling of Roman Reigns and the nobody talks about how he's just sometimes not there and how he hasn't defended the belt in three months. Like even if you thought he wasn't going to do that, you'd think you'd make that part of a storyline to make, like try to make him a bigger heel that he's never around, like they did with Brock, but they don't. 
it's just, it's just it's just never discussed why the uh, the main championship, the unified singles championship, is not on the show and why he's not around. It, it's bizarre. It reminds me of when uh, when they decided that Undertaker was going to beat Shane at that Mania a couple of years ago, and then be, and then after the match, Undertaker decided he was going to retire. LOL. Uh, yes, and Vince got mad because if well, if he knew this was going to be Undertaker's last match, he would have had Shane go over, which is also really funny. Uh, but and so they just pretended like Shane had won, and he was the GM for <laughs> for six months or a year or whatever. Sure. So it feel it feels like why why if they had known that he was going to be restructuring his deal or off TV for most of the summer or not working any pay per views. Why would they unify both world titles and put them on him? <laughs> like if they had known that at WrestleMania, why would they have done that? Uh, other, you know, you didn't have to do a title for title match. You didn't have to put the the raw belt back on Brock. You chose to do that. <laughs> and then you chose to put both titles on the line at, at the mania match. So just, just a lot of fascinating decisions that I would, would love to hear some uh, some insight on from uh, some people in the know, if there are such people existing currently. Yeah, it's pretty strange. It is. Uh, it's pretty strange. AEW Dynamite this week was pretty strange, also. <laughs> it uh, it was a wild. So, well, I guess turning back the clock, we go to Punk Rampage. Yeah, yeah. Rampage. CM Punk announces that he has as yet to be officially explained injuries. Um, and uh, we were told he had surgery on his lower leg by Jim yes. Ross on, tel- on uh, Dynamite this week. But he comes out, uh, appears to be saying that he... I took his messaging as I wanted to vacate the belt, but Tony Khan told me not to. And I was like, okay, so he's not going to be out that long. And then Chris Jericho said twice, he's vacating the belt, he's vacating the belt, and nobody corrected him. So I said, oh, I guess he's vacating the belt then. Um, and my underst- based on how this unfolded on television, it didn't seem like Excalibur or Taz knew either, because neither of them jumped in to correct Jericho when he said that. And then finally, we get some sort of clarification between the end of Rampage, where Excalibur tries to spit out all of this stuff, and then over the following days on social media that the title is not vacated, but they're doing an interim belt and that the, the title will be the interim belt will be decided between John Moxley and somebody that wins battle Royal. Yes. And, and then also, uh, and that the person who be, wins the match between battle Royal guy and, and John Moxley will face, either Hiroshi Tanahashi or Hiroki Goto at Forbidden Door. And the winner of that match will be the, for the, the new interim AEW champion until at such time as Punk is back. And really all that we were missing was Mike Tanay and Don West saying it's really quite simple. Correct. Correct. Very convoluted. Extremely convoluted <laughs> right. scenario. And we haven't even gotten to the actual Dynamite show, which, as you mentioned, was not a good show. <laughs> um, yeah. So then on Dynamite, uh, they have a battle royal where um, the winner will then face. The, so the winner will face the number one contender to be the AEW representative in the AEW interim title match. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. The wrestlers ranked two through five in their own rankings, which are fake, but they put them out every twice a week, every week. We're not in the battle royal. So it was 21 unranked guys in a battle royal rest, wrestling for the chance to wrestle the number one ranked guy while the number two through five ranked guys were not in the match. So then they have the number two ranked guy go out later in a promo and say that, well, you know what? I asked not to be in the battle Royal because I want to get a shot at CM Punk when he's back and healthy. It's like, dude, (laughs) if you win this tournament, you're the interim champion and the interim champion 
faces CM Punk for their full title when he's back. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Very dumb. And in the meantime, Wardlow decided to challenge for a belt that no one could possibly care about at this point, which is Scorpio Sky's TNT belt. And speaking of belts that nobody could care about, <laughs> they just out of nowhere decide to announce that they have a new singles men's title. The uh, it's a title with the, the 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 slant on this one, so to speak, is that it's it's going to feature a div- it's a division of non U.S. talent, right? It's it's, it's never explicitly stated though. Right. It's 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 got a bunch of flags on the belt and we'll get to the, the actual name of this because there's, you know, they're di- so they're doing a tournament bracket for this. They didn't do a tournament bracket for their interim world title, but they did a tournament bracket for this belt. They just suddenly announced was coming out and it's uh, a Canadian man wrestling a Bulgarian man. Yeah. A, a British man wrestling an Australian man. Yeah. Uh, Mexican man wrestling somebody else. I forget. And and then two Japanese men will wrestle each other. And then the winners of those four matches will have a fatal four way at the Forbidden Door show to crown the first ever. Is it the, is it the AEW International Championship? Well, that would make sense. Is it the AEW uh, Global Champion? It global. Uh, is it some kind of wacky branding name where it's like the... Uh, Star, I forget what Stardom's titles call. Stardom has some wacky title names. Uh, some, something that implies that it's just going to be like its own wacky little division, or is it, yes, you said something specifically mentioning global or international or something to imply that it will mostly feature non American talents. No, it is called the All Atlantic Championship, which is interesting. Because one of the four men in this presumably is going to be a Japanese man. And uh, Japan is not in the Atlantic. I don't know if, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's a secret. I'm not, you know, I'm not a geography major or anything, but I'm relatively sure that the, the Atlantic Ocean is not where you can find uh, Japan. So interesting naming, interesting idea to just announce this three weeks out from pay-per-view and uh, interesting that apparently, by default, all of the people uh, that were in this match or that are in this tournament just weren't interested in going for the world title. And uh, even though they, they didn't sp- explicitly say that, but like Pac and, and Miro and Ethan Page and Pentagon, none of them were in the world title battle royal, I guess, because they would rather win this all Atlantic belt. Uh, but yeah, so that's going to happen. It was really out of nowhere. And as someone else pointed out, you have all these ROH belts and you have your mm-hmm. other AEW belts. Why, why would now, like if, if it's one thing, if you think if, if your grand plan is that ring of honor if, is eventually going to be its own thing and you're going to take all those belts off of AEW television. But until then, why would you, introduce another men's championship when you have the AEW title, the interim AEW title, the TNT title, the ROH title, the ROH pure title, the ROH television title, the ROH tag titles. Why would you introduce yet another belt at this point, at this juncture in time? Yeah. I don't know why this was key to do this week. I I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I think the cracks are starting to show (laughs) in terms of one man doing everything in that company. And I think I've said this before. If my father had become a billionaire by making car bumpers or however it was that Shad Khan became a billionaire and bought a bunch of professional sports franchises and let me let me run them. Uh, basically, I would want all of Tony Khan's jobs except swap a Premier League soccer team for a baseball team. And I would try to run a baseball team, an NFL team, and a wrestling company at the same time. Those are my three main interests. So mm-hmm. I, 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 uh, I empathize with him. In that he's trying to do all of these dream jobs at once. I too, if I were 
the son of a billionaire car bumper maker <laughs> would would try to do all my dream, dream jobs at once. But I think now we're seeing the cracks of trying to do multiple full-time jobs at once. And AEW creatively and quality control wise and continuity wise, it's like they've always been very fly by the seat of your pants, but now even more so than ever, it's becoming evident that they're fly by the seat of your pants on television. Yeah, and it's it's it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where it is to an extent a self-inflicted problem where there are certainly people who work for your company currently who do have experience booking television and and working in the office and and there are people that could probably help you and you could delegate some of those. Obviously, as as we understand it, the original plan was not that Tony Khan Tony Khan maybe was the going to be the final say so guy in AEW always but the the EVPs were supposed to be running the company right that's why Cody was the public face doing press conferences and everything for the first year um right, right. and then at a certain point when you know the the faithful dark order beat down of the elite show uh tony khan decided that this wasn't working and it's his money and he needs to take a more hands-on approach i would also understand that if i had invested a bunch of my slash my billionaire car bumper father's money yes. into this thing and i thought cracks were starting to show under the people who were in charge i can understand wanting to be very hands-on with this sure and and wanting and going hey it's my money and i need and i don't like what i'm seeing on my television screen so I need to be the one in charge and I need to make, and I need to be the one that's actually booking all of these shows and deciding where we go and all that. Fine. I don't, again, I don't begrudge him for that for sure. But when you are also a full-time uh, head of, what is he, the head of the Jags analytics department and something along those lines. And then, yeah, it's the, the owner and, and GM of the, the Fulham football club. Um, it's like, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> too much man and it's it's not the shows as of late you are again you are fortunate that you have an incredibly talented roster who will put on very good matches and and are over with the crowd that that covers up some of these cracks but you know in in another two years when maybe the crowd is a little more tired of seeing some of these guys uh do you do you when the the welcome has worn off, are you still are you still going to be able to have a show that a million people watch every week? If these if these flaws aren't addressed now, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe this is maybe they have a super loyal audience like Raw and SmackDown do, where it'll just never drop below that whatever it did during the the pandemic, the seven hundred eighty thousand, and and maybe that'll keep. The, the Turner Network's happy and you'll be in business for another 10 years. I don't know. But it's it's definitely something that, especially when CM Punk and Brian Danielson are both hurt and you have other guys not on the shows. Kenny Omega has been hurt for months and who knows when he's coming back. The Hardys are banged up. Like all of these, you have a lot of your, your stars who you devote a lot of television time to. Adam Cole, uh, you know, all banged up or injured or off TV right now. It's like you're, those are, those are, those without that star power and those people that everybody likes putting on great matches and making memorable moments, people will start to notice the, the, the stuff in between that isn't good and, <laughs> and might start to harp on that a little bit more than they would, in, you know, in, in previous eras of this company. Tell you what, man, the checks must not have, have cleared this week because the most staunch AEW defenders in wrestling media, Brian Alvarez and Dave Meltzer, were extremely critical of AEW <laughs> this mm -hmm. week. The damnedest thing I ever heard. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I listened to a little bit of their their thoughts and I thought, and that's something we, we didn't talk about. Speaking of the world title, you touched on it that the the other people, the other two through five ranked contenders just weren't in the match with 
very little explanation. And then a week after this MJF promo that was supposed to be a heel promo that got cheered, Hangman Page comes out and says, like, well, guess I'm not sniffing the world title anytime soon. And everybody boos, <laughs> uh, which I feel like is a bad sign because, again, that's him pointing out well, they didn't book me in the world title match. So I guess I'm not going to be the world champion again anytime soon. And people didn't like that because they like hangman. Uh, and so, and then he, and then he challenges Okada, obviously, but <laughs> uh, which is obviously people will like that, but it, but it is a weird thing to have this guy who's been one of your top guys and, you know, was a, a building block to the starting t- days of your promotion and you built up a you know an 18 month storyline to him finally winning the world title and then 2 weeks after he's lost it he's just like yeah i guess i'm just hanging out from now on <laughs> like it's weird it was a it was a weird show the angles the the justifications for why certain people weren't in these matches were either just not given at all or the ones they gave were not good <laughs> And then yeah. yeah you're and then you're also whether you mean to or not are drawing attention to the fact that well, yeah, why wouldn't why wouldn't Hangman Page be in that battle <laughs> royal? Which is as we were talking off the air, if the 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 honest answer I would guess is you don't want to beat Hangman Page or you don't, again right away or you don't want to beat the other top you don't want Wardlow getting dumped out of a battle royal and you also don't want him losing to John Moxley. I mean, you could just have him win and win the world title. That's how it's an option. If, that, if there's a guy you just refuse to beat, maybe he should just win all the time and be your world champion. That's always an idea. But, yeah. but in the short term, either come up with a better justification for it, or in my opinion, it's a lot better to quote unquote beat guys by having them get thrown out of the battle royal because you can have 10 men gang up on Wardlow to get him out of the ring, or you can have whoever Hangman Page is going to be feuding with next sneak in from behind and throw him out or whatever. But to not to not even really address why like Hangman wasn't in it, why Adam Cole, again, in real life, I guess Adam Cole was banged up and hurt, but they didn't say that. Adam Cole just came out and he was doing doing commentary, and then he got mad when... <laughs> when hangman said he wanted to be the IWGP champion and said, if anyone was going to be, he was going to be. So now you're reigniting (laughs) the Adam Cole hangman feud, which was settled very recently and they're feuding over another promotions belt. (laughs) It's utterly, it's utterly bizarre. Mainly it is good though, that um, people on screen at all times are either, uh, all segments in AEW are either Adam Cole or Britt Baker, Britt Baker segments, or people are asking, <laughs> where is Adam Cole? Where is Britt Baker? <laughs> what is Adam Cole doing? What is Britt Baker doing? Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, they should probably be the champions. It's my, my takeaway, given how much television time and character work is devoted to them. And if Tony Khan was adamant that Okada and Hangman is not happening, then Okada and Cole is definitely happening. Mm-hmm. And then in that case, Cole has to beat Hangman anyway. <laughs> to set yeah. that up. Yeah, somebody's yeah. <sighs> I don't know, man. I also I just feel like the idea that you didn't want to beat those guys again, you don't have to actually pin them if it's a battle royal. And then if one of them does win that, let's say Hangman won the battle royal, like Hangman's not being hurt by losing to John Moxley in the main event. Like maybe, and again, maybe that specific match, hey, we want to hold this off and we're going to do it on pay-per-view in a year or whatever. Okay, fine. Then again, the other, any of these other guys or any of the other single stars that maybe aren't ranked, but should have been in that match, like Miro, like Pac, like Christian, Jungle Boy, whoever like all of these guys that just weren't in it meanwhile billy gunn's dickhead sons were meanwhile you know people like that there was just the people that were in this match did not did not warrant that chris jericho wasn't in it even though like eddie kingston who's feuding with chris jericho was in it some of the other jericho guys were in it um but jericho wasn't in he's the first ever champion you'd think he'd want a shot to get back at that that world title but just wasn't on the show. So I don't know, man, just it was, I'm trying not to like take this, this having, it's like, okay, they had, they had a really bad show this week 
and therefore the company is the wheels are falling off everything's everything's gone because again they still produce very good wrestling but it is a sign of eventually if you're if you're you need to keep that in ring and the and the stars at a certain level for fans to 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 not notice the the bad stuff and i didn't think that the in ring or the the star power of this show was enough to ignore or forgive all of the many, many flaws that we've just laid out of the show. Well, the good news is they have more content to deliver us on Friday and then more content to <laughs> deliver us next week. Yeah, Will Ospreay is just wrestling on Friday at 10 p.m. on a taped Rampage show. That's his first AEW match. Is some of the, I think, okay, I have a theory about if everyone is uh, all elite, then uh, no one's all elite. Like CM Punk's line about if everyone's a champion, then nobody's a champion. Mm-hmm. How much of the Forbidden Door stuff helps or hurts um, AEW? I think it hurts them because it scatters their already scatterbrained head of creatives focus. And also, you're doing dream matches. <clears throat> Excuse me. Part of the uh, allure, I feel like part of the allure of if everybody works, every, if I can tune on, if I can, if everybody works everywhere, then and, uh, no one's special anywhere. And if I can turn on my television and see uh, Osprey in AEW on Wednesday and Friday, and then I see him in New Japan on Sunday and et cetera, et cetera. I don't think the Forbidden Door helps in the long run or helps when it's used as often as it is. I don't know if that's a hot take or not, but no, that makes sense. I think that's, that's a, a good point there. Where there's it, it theoretically should be a really big deal when somebody from, from new Japan, especially like a top star, like Jay white or Will Ospreay is not only appearing on your show, but is wrestling on your show. And it definitely does not always always feel that way. Like, I mean, it got a good reaction, but it's like Will Ospreay is coming in to wrestle Trent. <laughs> uh, no offense to Trent, but that's not near the top of the list of anybody that I'd uh, that I'd want to see him wrestle in in uh, in that company. I mean, I, I thought about that a little bit on the other end when when I went to the, the New Japan Strong tapings in uh, in uh, in Philly a f- uh, last month, and it's like. QT Marshall's wrestling on this show. And, and some of these other guys, you know, the AEW guys, Chris Daniels is on the show and Eddie Kingston and, and, and some of these guys, again, not that I don't like any of those guys, but it's like, this is a, this is a new Japan show. I, I kind of want to see new Japan talent. If I'm, if I'm paying to go see a new Japan show. And again, I imagine this will die. It won't be as extreme once this, this joint show is over. Um, but the but as of now yeah it's it's overload and it's hard every it can't all feel like a big deal if if somebody's running out every two segments from the other show to to beat up your guys um so yeah that's like i said it's probably going to be a good show on paper there'll probably be some good matches and everything but uh just 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 a lot and just not a the way the show was laid out, and by the way, we didn't even mention Kyle O'Reilly won the Battle Royal uh, and then lost to John Moxley, uh, which I mean, fine, whatever. Uh, but I mean, I've known Kyle O'Reilly for uh, like fifteen years. Sure, Kyle is by all accounts one of the nicest guys in wrestling, mm-hmm. and I've seen interviews with him where it's like. Man, he seems like a really nice guy. I like that guy. When it comes to the aspects of pro wrestling that I put the most um, stock in, mm-hmm. Kyle O'Reilly is about a negative 37 <laughs> on a scale of 1 to 10 <laughs> on, on everything that I care about in wrestling, except his air guitar playing, which, is, which is the best since Hulk Hogan. That's, um, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, it's just, and I know he had beaten Darby at the last show, and usually when somebody wins a singles match on their pay-per-views, that is gearing them up for something. But 
ideally this wasn't it unless he was going to wrestle punk on tv originally between these two shows because obviously they didn't they the plan was punk and tanahashi and then they right. and then punk got hurt and they had to scramble here so i don't know why they you know rushed to defeat defeat kyle to this guy when you again you had you had other options that would probably have been bigger matches and would have made this feel more important but it's like yeah kyle o'reilly eliminates like ray phoenix and yuda <laughs> to uh yeah. to be the the number two contender to the world title and then just loses to john moxley the same night again i don't i don't have a problem with like an underdog mid-card guy winning that battle royal and facing moxley i just I feel like it would have been a bigger deal if he had, you know, outlasted some of the actual big stars in the company and not just some guys. Yeah. Yeah. There is also the aspect of the forbidden door where it's not like AEW has a talent shortage, a star shortage. (laughs) No, they do Do not. And now we're taking the focus and putting it on another company's talent. It's, kind of bizarre in that way too well i mean it does bolster the aspect of their shows which are when's a new person gonna appear as you pointed (laughs) out that is one of the the main the lifeblood of this show some three years in is that you know a new person popping up and at any time uh, someone that didn't work here last week could show up and that could be a former WWE person. It could be an impact person. It could be a new Japan person, whatever. But uh, it, uh, it, it, so I think that it does bolster that because now you have a whole new company's worth of people <laughs> that you can have show up on your television. If that's what you, if you think that's an important part of your show to, to have that, that unpredictability of like a, you know, a 98, 99 uh, Monday night television wrestling show. But, you know, long term, the things that were successful for, say, WCW were not, you know, random people popping up. It was, you know, a certain few select big stars uh, that that drew money when you put them together and had them wrestle each other. So, uh, you know, I think it could be part of the presentation. And certainly uh, it certainly is a fun, a wonderful variety uh, uh, show to uh, to add that to your show but it is something that is not so sustainable unless you plan on it's like hey we don't have to really pay these guys <laughs> to be on their show because they work for somebody else they're just we're just borrowing them so it's a way to bolster the the uh, the never-ending market of surprise appearances that the that AEW looks to deliver and that they've I think somewhat conditioned their fans to expect there is the uh, yeah i forgot that uh this promotion built entirely on surprises Mm -hmm. (laughs) and announcements don't forget the announcements it's an announcing announcements Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes yeah uh dominions this weekend jay white and okada for the iwgp title is the big match i don't expect okada is going to lose that title anytime this year with it being the 50th anniversary year and them being very into Okada. Mm-hmm. Um, Same. Yeah. What? So, so <laughs> he's a handsome man. Uh, so uh, yeah. So I, I don't. I don't see this as a huge show. Her, I mean, Hiroki Goto versus um, uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi for the right to challenge for the interim AEW World Title. All right. And uh, yeah, and then uh, Hiromu won uh, the best of the super juniors for the third year in a row and the fourth year overall. Mm -hmm. And he's challenging for the uh, junior title, not at Dominion on a house show next month. (laughs) In a couple weeks. I love, I I just, and it's one of those things where I understand, especially over the last, the, the pandemic years, there's only so many guys you can book strong. Yeah. that people will buy but especially this year like they got some guys from impact they had yuda and like it felt like this was like oh this this is gonna be like we're getting back to like the glory days of the best of the super juniors and it's uh and again it's a good match it's a good match i understand why you go back to it a lot but el desperado and hiromu in the finals for the you know like 10th time and 
in in three years they wrestled or something and and it was it, it was a good match but it's and then yes Hiromu won again because that's just kind of what happens here and you know I know he has that vow that he wants to main event at Tokyo Dome and maybe he'll get his wish because you know eventually there will be more uh, Tokyo Dome shows <laughs> than days in in the year uh, so yeah. maybe eventually he'll get his wish, but it's like, boy, it feels like it's time for uh, maybe for 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 uh, for old Hiromu to uh, to put on a few pounds and and move up and out because boy, we got we got uh, that that junior division with him on top. As good as he is, it's it's a it's a little top heavy, and and there's not much left for the uh, for the other guys hanging around in that in that division. Yes, and uh, they've also uh, fined uh, uh, Kota Ibushi uh, a percentage of his salary over the next three months, and fined the company president, and uh, and moved fined and moved uh, Ghetto's booking assistant to a new position within the company, which mm-hmm. is uh, just a whole bizarre scenario of events that I don't really know how to begin to talk about. <laughs> No, yeah, you, I mean, you just hope everyone is, you know, especially Ibushi in this case is, you know, mentally okay, and you know, and and everything. But yeah, that was a, it's it's been incredibly messy, and they <laughs> they announced that like here is the official like resolution of this, and immediately Ibushi was like, nope, that sucks, that's not right. And then a week later, they're like, okay, now we find Ibushi and also the president <laughs> and and moved this guy out of his role or whatever. And I still don't feel like that satisfied anyone. So, you know, hope everyone's okay. <laughs> hope, yeah. you know, hope, hope. Like, I don't, I don't, I mean, the last thing that matters at this point, obviously, if he's having a something of a crisis of conscience or a mental health crisis is whether or not he wrestles again or wrestles for new Japan. But yeah, you know, I hope he's, I hope he's all right. And that he's gets himself healthy and does what is best for, you know, his, his, his career and his personal life going forward. All right. Uh, we've certainly uh, covered the entire globe, the Atlantic, the Pacific, everywhere. The all Atlantic uh, edition of this pod, you might say. Correct. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to discuss this week? No, I think that uh, that about covers the uh, the big the big notes here. We got a, a Money in the Bank show that's not in the stadium and no longer has a world title match. But uh, you know, as we talk about every year, it'll be fun to see if they decide to uh, create a new star with one of their two Money in the Bank matches or just reinforce one of the existing stars. That's that's usually the fun of Money in the Bank for me is just seeing. We gonna try this year? We gonna we gonna try to make somebody this year? Or are we just gonna we're just gonna give the briefcase to like Randy Orton again? Yeah, yeah, probably probably the latter. It's been a few <laughs> years since they really tried. Yeah, so mm-hmm. they may be willing to try with on on the women's side, but we don't know. Oh, so. oh, we should. We would be remiss not to mention uh, Finn Balor turned heel and kicked Edge out of his own stable one night after Edge beat his ass and pinned him. Uh, uh, because uh, I think when, with Cody being down for a time, they looked around at who they had on the top baby face side and went, well, we got Lashley, you know, that's good. He's our top guy. Who else we got? And there were tumbleweeds. So Edge is going to be a baby face again. Hey, look, uh, I, I just don't know how Edge can be a baby face. He spent the last three months telling the people how much he hates them and how they're sheep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then the, the, his big, the thing that the, his big empathetic thing is he got his, he got his ass kicked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I don't, I don't like guys turning baby face by being beat up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really weak and it's really dumb and it doesn't make sense. I'm also not convinced that, Edge is going to be the top baby face. Just, I mean, I think he's going to be away for several months, for several weeks at least, selling, selling this beat down. But also, um, he's he's pretty old and he's pretty fragile. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think Vince is going to push him as a top baby face. I just don't. I think I think Bob Lashley is going to get that spot. Which fine. What is even a top baby face anymore? If <laughs> they're not wrestling for a championship. Like, <laughs> well, they did have Lashley tease that he's going to go after the title. So maybe that's. Well, we we've already know that Drew Drew is decided he's going to challenge for at the Wales show, uh, SummerSlam we think is Randy Orton, and then for some reason Roman Reigns is going to do his one other title defense this calendar year against Matt Riddle. Uh, so I don't know, maybe Lashley will wrestle Roman at like the Rumble, <laughs> right? Which makes it even stranger that they did that thing six six months ago or mm-hmm. six months ahead of time at. Uh, at Hell in a Cell with Lashley posing with the with the belt from the fan, but regardless. It's long-term storytelling. That's what that is. Well, uh, when you reference well, something and then wait six months to follow up on it, that's that's called long-term storytelling, or so I'm told. Certainly. Well, now your favorite group, the Judgment Day, has a new leader in Finn Balor to go along with Damian Priest and uh, Rhea Ripley. How do you feel about the heel Finn Balor? I mean, that's... I mean, I guess he was a heel in NXT on his second run there, but um, I don't know. They never really tried Finn as a heel on the main roster. Um, he is small still. Unfortunately, turning heel doesn't help him grow <laughs> grow six inches. Uh, but you are generally booked better as a heel in this company than you are as a babyface. So, oh yeah. Um, and hey, you know, you have you have Damian Priest, you have Rhea Ripley, and now you have uh, the, the the demon is the leader. So they can really, really lean in. If you thought they were leaning into garbage, spooky time wrestling tropes that Br- Vince and Bruce Pritchard love before. Oh, now we're really going to we're they're going to be teleporting. They're going to be shooting lightning. They're going to be. They're going to be doing all kinds of wacky, spooky stuff. Uh, just very cinematic television coming coming your way with, with Finn Balor and that group, I'm sure. And then uh, I don't know what happened. AJ Styles got busted open really bad in that match on Sunday night. There's like fan cam of him just gushing blood. And then he wasn't on Raw Monday. So I would assume you AJ, AJ just keeps feuding with, <laughs> with the Judgment Day. Uh and I get I guess you have money in the bank, so you can just throw both those guys in the ladder match or whatever. It's one of those shows where they get a month off from having to try. Yes. Um, so because you, you get to put eight guys in a ladder match. Um, but you, you do a bunch of qualifying matches on TV leading up to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's 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 made. But yeah, for like if you're looking at like what's gonna happen at SummerSlam, it's like I mean, you could just do that six person again, but have Edge and Finn swap teams, I guess. Like you could just poor Liv can keep uh, getting her getting getting beaten by Rhea every week in the meantime. And oh, they're doing Rhea and Bianca, which, boy, if I were Bianca, I would not want to have to wrestle any spooky wrestlers. (laughs) Like that's that's just always a recipe for when like the, the awesome superstar legit athlete has to wrestle the spooky guy or girl in this case it's just it's it's never good but we love this we love this we're gonna bianca is going to be menaced by the magic powers of the judgment day and she's going to have to sell confliction and fear and it's going to just be wonderful television yep that to look forward to i was looking at the in the observer last week at the uh like the quarterly hours on uh, wwe television it's like Pretty consistently, Roman Reigns and Becky Lynch segments do the best with uh, 18 to 49. And it's like, huh, the only two people they protect in their booking, <laughs> the only two people on these television shows that are presented as larger than life stars, and they their segments do the best. Huh, what do you know about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, well, gee, I mean, it can't have anything to do with that because we've been told by, you know, the people in charge of that company that it's not about. It's not about wins and losses or who holds the titles or anything like that. It's just, you know, it's about vibes, man. And uh, and only Becky Lynch and Roman Reigns have those, the the correct vibes to be a, to be a star in this company. It's not, uh, it's just pure coincidence that they, they never lose. Although Becky did just do a job to Dana Brooks. So (laughs) they might be trying to kill, (laughs) to kill the second, the only other draw besides Roman Reigns, who isn't on TV half the time. What the hell was that? <laughs> the hell was that? 
It was what? very strange. Why did she say yes to that? <laughs> Brother, is this like is this like when Hogan let Kidman beat him? Is she just gonna beat everybody for the next year and she's gonna point to this as the match where she she put somebody over? I mean, hopefully. <laughs> I hope I love the I'm really into the idea right now of of like backbiting politician Becky Lynch and and that this is gonna be her her Rey Mysterio pin pinned Kevin Nash uh <laughs> yes. moment where for the for the next 10 years of her career uh she, when she's asked about putting people over she points to this match that's that's what I'm hopeful for yes I did a job for Dana Brooke in a 24-7 match <laughs> <laughs> what totally forgot about that <laughs> like, what the hell is happening utterly bizarre and it's worth it. Dana Brooke is like going around selling us like she actually beat Becky Lynch. And it's just like, well, that just makes Dana Brooke look bad. Well, Becky what it looked- means is that we need to we need Dana to learn her place and she's going to lose in 30 seconds next week, probably. So we're going to beat her like a drum. What more again yes. every week? More <laughs> every week? <laughs> Well, specifically, Becky needs to like beat her up and embarrass her and, and make her tap out like three weeks in a row now just to make sure she doesn't get uh, too big of a head. Sure, why not? I've been going for a long time now. Anything else? No, I think that will wrap us up. All right. Until next time, everybody, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Goodbye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. It's it's one of the great dreams I've ever had. (laughs) That's that's up there. I can't. Yes. Where mom's boyfriend crept down the stairs and yelled or said home alone in my face while I was waiting for you. And then when you got home, he was supposed to be asleep, not awake. So he yelled, I'm busted, took his shirt off and jumped down a flight of steps. <laughs> Well, that's, I love a, I love a good like physical comedy payoff to a bit. Really, that's that might be the best part of it to me is 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 ending the bit as as silly and and funny as the the verbal part of that is. The funniest part to me is maybe just envisioning uh, a grown man <laughs> shirtless just. Trying to quote unquote escape a, a scenario by jumping down a flight of stairs. <laughs> yes. That's wonderful to me. Yes. Yeah. What are we drinking tonight? Uh, one of my five remaining Coke energies. Oof. The final countdown. I think I'm down to four now. I think I'm down to four. They came four in a package. So down to the last package. Oof. End, end of an era. It really is. Hopefully, like Triple H and Undertaker's end of an era, you'll find another large supply of Coke energy in Australia <laughs> in 10 years. Supposedly, they are still making it internationally, I think. So, okay. uh, should be able to import it. <laughs> Gotta go yeah, to at some a- point. Amazon, Amazon.ca and see if you can get it across the border. Right. At some point, though, it's like, all right. How much am I willing to pay? (laughs) (laughs) Figure out that dollar figure. (laughs) Right. So then you're paying shipping and you're paying international shipping. Mm -hmm. I try to keep on keeping on.